This meeting is being recorded. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for another virtual program. Uh, I know we did a lot of them all throughout COVID and we all um, have some heard some great speakers and I know you're in for another great one tonight. For those possibly tuning in for the first time, my name is Abby Huffman. I am Director of Programs with Adams County Historical Society and the new uh, Gettysburg Beyond the Battle Museum. Our job is to not only share the stories of local families and genealogies and the county records, but to also educate you on some topics maybe you haven't heard much about, like the civilians of Gettysburg, our county history, and the topic tonight, which is talking a lot about a place that's not very close to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So without further ado, I, of course, again, would like to thank you so much for joining us. Please feel free to subscribe onto our social media channels. Donations are always appreciated so we can keep these programs coming to you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard in Civil War Seattle. Thank you, Abby, and thank you guys uh, all for tuning in for tonight's program. Um, my name is Richard. I am the founder of Civil War Seattle. Uh, what that is is my public history project that is based on the study and sharing of the history of Seattle area Civil War veterans. Um, of course, uh, the Civil War didn't really have much to do here with the Washington Territory at the time. It was peripheral at best. And what I focus on is the stories of those who arrived here and became very important part of our pioneering and formative generation in our Western Washington cities in the wake of the Civil War. So what we have uh, tonight is a discussion or a presentation here about men who were, were critical, important parts of Seattle history. But these are in many cases, as you'll find out, the very same men uh, who stood on the battlefield at Gettysburg in those three days of July of 19, or <clears throat> 1863, and then returned back to the site of that battle in 1913 for the 50th anniversary reunion. So what we're going to kind of talk about is what these men did during the battle, what they did uh, here in Seattle and Tacoma and Spokane to a, a degree, and then their journey back to Pennsylvania. Many of these are native Pennsylvanians, and there'll be a lot of connections uh, with South Central Pennsylvania among these men who, who decades after the war make their way back there uh, to, to come to terms with the battle, to reunite with their comrades that they hadn't seen in so many years. So while the Civil War may seem disconnected and, and mutually exclusive from a place like Seattle, it's really not. And, and our historical fabric, our foundation uh, is built upon uh, the lives and the efforts of many men who had really made Gettysburg what Gettysburg is. You know, I like to tell people that it wasn't the rocks and the hills and the fence lines that made Gettysburg the hallowed ground that it is. It's what the men who fought there did. And we have dozens and dozens and dozens of them who are also important Seattle citizens who had, who had come here after uh, the war. So that's a little basic introduction. Also, uh, I'm sure many watching tonight are probably already familiar with the 1913 uh, reunion, but just in brief, uh, so I don't get too bogged down with, with that, is that it was the 50th anniversary celebration, a great peace jubilee to commemorate uh, the Battle of Gettysburg and really be this, this moment of, of sort of national healing and a, a figurative bearing of the hatchet, so to speak, for, for the veterans, but also for the nation. Uh, more than 40,000 veterans congregated on the battlefield, more than half of them from Pennsylvania, but of course, delegations from other states all across the Union, Washington included. Um, so I would say for, for more on that, there's plenty of resources about that. Um, with the, with the Historical Society and, and others with books and things that if, if you need to get more information after what I'm done with, uh, you can feel free to do that. So let's begin. So speaking of Seattle, this is an image of Seattle in the 1890s. Uh, overlaid with it, uh, of course, are men who had fought in the Civil War. And that reinforces the idea that these men were a critical part of our local history. Uh, Seattle is a very young city compared to towns and cities in Pennsylvania, South Central Pennsylvania. 
uh, it really didn't see its formative era until the late 1880s, 1890s, 30 years after the war had concluded. In many cases, these soldiers are arriving here. So that's a little look at their lives here in Seattle at the point uh, that they're here and they're these, these, these important citizens and they're as they're aging and then uh, coming into 1913. So here we have Governor Ernest Lister on the left side of the screen. He is the Washington state governor in 1913. He was a massive, massive force in organizing this effort to get surviving veterans of the Battle of Gettysburg to the reunion in Pennsylvania, in Gettysburg, in Adams County in 1913. You can see his words here. Uh, they're, they're appreciative of, of the valor of the moment that this was really gonna be the, the final opportunity uh, for a large scale reunion of any sort uh, with these with these veterans. Um, in this speech he's giving to the citizens of Tacoma, Washington on May 30th of 1913. So even as they're typically celebrating their Memorial Day, Gettysburg is looming large because of this reunion that is upcoming in July of that year and the state is sort of mobilizing and the people are mobilizing to send our representative veterans to that reunion. So as you can read this here, you can see uh, how he's framing this and presenting its importance to the people, even though you wouldn't think that, that, that people in Tacoma or Washington or Seattle would really care much about what's happening in Adams County in July of 1913. It is, it's an important event and it's something that they're, they're it, it's, it's very public, so to speak. So here's how we received it. So the 1913 reunion, of course, was started at the federal level with an appropriation by Congress of $100,000 uh, to fund this great encampment of the blue and the gray on the Gettysburg battlefield. The state of Pennsylvania uh, had a much larger appropriation to begin with of $250,000 uh, to see that this event took place and to host not just the veterans of Pennsylvania, but veterans across the country. And you can see on the left side or on the right side here is an invitation from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, specifically to the state of Washington, Governor Ernest Lister, inviting them to please come here and celebrate and commemorate and remember this great battle on its 50th anniversary, courtesy of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And there's a newspaper clipping there uh, announcing to the citizens of Washington, this event was in papers all across our state, that this event would be upcoming. So as it, as it is announced, a lot of moving parts, uh, moving pieces are, are, are in action to see that this is going to happen. The soldiers themselves, the veterans themselves, have been expecting this for about two years. It's been discussed since 1911 or 1912 at Grand Army of the Republic national encampments, but also on the local level. So I think when it was finally announced that the, that the, that the federal government and the state of Pennsylvania were really gonna make this happen, uh, the citizens of the state hear about it. There's a lot of excitement here in Washington, just as there is in Pennsylvania or New York or New Jersey. So states other than Pennsylvania, following the, in the example of Wisconsin, decided if, the federal government is gonna support this encampment and they're gonna to pay to house and feed and provide health care and all of these things for the veterans while they are there in the state of Pennsylvania that the states would assume the responsibility of getting the veterans to and from the event. Wisconsin was the first uh, and a lot of other states, all the other states except one followed in their, in their example, Washington being no exception. Here we can see on the left side, the first attempt at getting this funding uh, to send our Washington state veterans to Gettysburg was uh, taken up by King County, which is the, the county where Seattle resides in Washington, King County uh, representative, Eugene Hurd. Uh, he was gonna first pass a bill to pass it into law. That bill was actually voted down by the Washington state legislature, $15,000 they were gonna appropriate to send the veterans to 
put them on a train to feed and take care of them, do Washington's part to match what Pennsylvania was doing, match what the federal government was doing. That failed initially. It was taken up by another man from also from Seattle and King County, his signature at the bottom right, Josiah Collins. Um, he passed it through, here's his picture on the right, uh, as a simple state appropriation. And I think perhaps that was why it was voted down is that they didn't need it passed into state law, but they did need to find the funding. So rejecting it as a law, but then opening it uh, for approval for a simple state appropriation is what was done. Uh, so again, here's Senator, State Senator Josiah Collins on your right. And then on the left there is Dr. Eugene Hurd. He was the sponsor of that original bill. He is on that wagon on the right side, a very successful surgeon during World War I. You'll find that a lot of the people that were involved in this project went on to become very significant people as well. It was met with some interesting reactions. Uh, on the right here, we have a picture of 12th Massachusetts Infantry veteran William Henry Rugg. Uh, the 12th Massachusetts, of course, famously fought to the last on Oak Ridge or uh, with the first Corps on July 1st. Uh, he was very motivated to go back to the event, um, but he wasn't, it wasn't unanimous. So this letter that we see on the left uh, is a letter that was sent, a petition that was sent to Governor Lister once this state appropriation was in consideration. Uh, and the soldiers saying, it's great, we support our veterans going back to Gettysburg. It's a remarkable event. We wish them all the success, but we don't wanna do it on the state's dime. Like, why are we paying for them? We have our soldiers home here in Washington, which was state funded, uh, was not a national home like in other states, it was state funded. Uh, it's underfunded and overcrowded and why don't $15,000 would do so much for that uh, or other pressing needs here at home, you know, why it's kind of an argument. Why are we going to the moon when we got problems down here? The government or uh, these, these veterans are saying that to our state government. Of course, they didn't prevail because I wouldn't be doing a presentation on this if they were successful. Uh, but there was actually pushback from the veterans themselves about this event. So I'm assuming the citizenry of Washington probably also resisted this effort to some minor degree, but nonetheless, there was more broad public support that sent them. Uh, but Henry Rugg has, he was very vocal about this. He was extremely excited. He fought uh, hard with the 12th Massachusetts. He was captured and he was sent to Confederate prisons. Mostly his time was spent at Andersonville as a result of his Gettysburg capture. He was definitely one to exaggerate a little bit. He was a private in the 12th Massachusetts, although he had, uh, somehow established his identity to everyone else as Colonel Henry, William Henry Rugg. Uh, he spent, according to him, 26 months in Andersonville prison, which having been captured at Gettysburg didn't mean that he didn't get out of Andersonville prison until August of 1865, several months after the war ended. Uh, he, he liked to stretch things a little bit. He's a, an interesting character for sure, uh, but clearly his life was dramatically impacted by his capture on July 1st at Gettysburg. Uh, and then of course he wound up being one of 14,000 Civil War veterans that lived here in Washington territory between 1865 and 1951. Now he had some interesting things because he's writing to the government also as he's expressing his enthusiasm to visit this encampment to talk about what he thinks they should do. Why are we, we gonna pay to charter a train and pay all this food? Just give us four or five days rations in our haversacks. And otherwise we all we need is a glass of water and a toothpick. You know, we're tough old soldiers. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, and, and the initial plan was for our Washington veterans to have their own quarters because they're traveling across the country, four day journey each way on the train, especially chartered train. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then they would stay on that. And rather than stay in the camp with all the other soldiers and Henry Rugg is saying, man, I got the corns, I've got a foot, a stomach problem. I don't want to march a mile back from spending a day traipsing the battlefield and visiting comrades and going to events and have to march a mile back just to sleep and all of this. Uh, so he's kind of makes some cases with some arguments for, for some things that actually, uh, I think, alter the planning of this trip. 
But here's what the soldiers really had to say. And I see this over, it's consistent and overwhelming is this incredible enthusiasm to travel not only back to see their comrades, many of these men having left the East, having left Connecticut or Pennsylvania or Ohio after the war, haven't traveled back for 40 years, 30 years in some cases. They haven't seen friends, families. They haven't seen the men they served with uh, from towns in Pennsylvania or upstate New York. Uh, they're very removed. And so I think there's a special motivation for these men to reconnect not only with the war and with their, their experiences, but also simply just their, their friends and comrades that they have been more isolated from than say veterans in Pennsylvania. Um, and there's a real unanim unanimity, I think of, of comradeship between our Washington state Confederate and union veterans at this point especially those that are going to make the trip to Gettysburg. Uh, a little bit more so because th than other places, because we don't have such sectional division here uh, as you would, you know, not so much isolation. Pennsylvania veterans or New York veterans might not interact with Confederate veterans from South Carolina or Texas as much. But here in Washington, we're all kind of tossed in this blender together and they have all kind of got to make their way together uh, socially and in business and on Memorial Day and all of these different things. Uh, we've been having blue-gray reunions at this point in Seattle since 1891, uh, a little bit ahead of the curve nationally. And especially in 1912, there was an event that happened that really brought our Confederate and Union veterans together. And here they are discussing, you can see these two soldiers sitting on the right there. There are two men from Seattle, Hiram Weaver, Maryland cavalryman, a Confederate, and Edward Phelps, a Union veteran. Uh, and they have this whole conversation recorded between the two about going back to Gettysburg and they're gonna visit Little Round Top and Devil's Den and the places they fought. And they're gonna figure out how did you guys win? How did Longstreet not succeed on Little Round Top? How did, how did uh, Pickett's Charge not succeed? Or how did the Union manage to get these positions? And they're, they're kind of debating all this stuff in a very friendly back and forth kind of way. So too are the men on the left. Uh, Lawrence Alfred, the Confederate, he fought on Culp's Hill for two and a half days at the Battle of Gettysburg. And Jacob Noel on the right, both to Coleman's, Jacob Noel was wounded at the Battle of Gettysburg. He was on the staff of John Fulton Reynolds when he was killed on the morning of July 1st, 1863, supposedly the only naval officer to serve at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, they also have a very similar conversation about Let's, let's go back and walk the field at Gettysburg, friend. You know, they, these guys have been fellow Tacoma citizens together in their different businesses. And now they're going to they're gonna, uh, make their way back to the battlefield together. And there's a real tight comradeship among, among the men. So I'm going to speed through here a little bit. Uh, this is an image of a group of Spokane veterans. Uh, the majority of them came from Seattle and Tacoma. That's 1913 as well as now where the bulk of the population was but these are some Gettysburg veterans from Spokane Washington now it was only Gettysburg veterans that could go the state wasn't going to send all of our 12,000 10,000 at that point surviving Civil War veterans you had to be a veteran of the Battle of Gettysburg you had to prove it on paper it was easy for some they had discharge papers they had pension records not so either for others who had lost their paperwork in a house fire or some other kind of event like that. It was particularly challenging for Confederates because they don't have discharge papers and they don't have records uh, to draw on like the federal soldiers. So they were forced by the state of Washington to essentially sign an affidavit, uh, personally swearing to the fact that yes, they were at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, all this paperwork is pouring into our state government to create a list of those eligible to go on the trip for that $15,000 uh, appropriation to send them. There's not many Confederates. Uh, there's only about a dozen that go. So I think at that point, the proving your Confederate service, it wasn't like there's 300 Confederates clamoring to go. There was still a very small number and they basically just took their word for it. But they didn't quite have enough money because they initially thought there was gonna be 100 veterans that were gonna go. And it turned out that there was gonna be 162 and of the Western states, California, Nevada, Colorado, Idaho, 
Montana, Oregon, so on. Washington sent by far the largest delegation, 167 is the highest estimate I've seen. Some say 162, uh, which is still over 60% higher than the next most populous delegation, which was California. So $15,000 was good for 100 men, but not 160. So they couldn't get money appropriated from the government to fill that gaps in two months before they, the, the legislature was not in session. So Gettysburg veteran on the right, Horace Chapin Henry, 14th Vermont infantryman, 16th Vermont, I believe, sorry. Um, very wealthy railroad capitalist and philanthropist paid out of his pocket to send the veterans back, the remaining veterans back to Gettysburg to make sure that none would be left behind. Uh, so this, this Gettysburg veteran, this very, very leading citizen here in Seattle, uh, takes it upon himself to make sure that all of our Gettysburg veterans that can make the trip are able to. Uh, and here's a little bit of a couple letters of thanks from veterans uh, to him, the Grand Army of the Republic's kind of premier post in the state of Washington, the Stevens Post of, of Seattle. There's a letter on the right there thanking them because when the government paid him back that $5,000 a couple of years later, he said, I don't want the money. This isn't about me. And he gave that money in part to a tuberculosis hospital he founded, and then also the other half to the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, so this was all related around the Gettysburg uh, trip. Here's the itinerary for this train trip. It's going to leave several days before the reunion. It has to. It takes four days to travel there. It's going to be 12 cars, eight tourist sleeper cars, which you can see on the right. Uh, our troops sometimes double up uh, in their berths, so we have two men uh, to a train, but it's also equipped with a dining car and a tourist observation car on uh, a baggage car. And it's fully staffed with medical care and food and everything to make for a comfortable trip. Uh, here's the itinerary that the soldiers were given. A really neat thing, I just like to feature this one on the right there, uh, is how they were fed because they had 165 men that had to eat and plus all the other people that were on the train. So they issued out cards, red, white, and blue cards. Uh, that entitled you to which shift you were to eat uh, your sitting, your seating during during the meals, and you could exchange them if you wanted to eat earlier or later or whatever. But that's the whole system of rotating the soldiers through on the train to get all their meals and everything. It's it's a neat and complex operation to get there. These are old men. The average age was 78 at the reunion, so they had to be well cared for. The state provided a surgeon. Uh, Dr. Howard Knott, you can see there, a Seattle-based railroad surgeon. So he was a traveling doctor for the railroad that took care of uh, the men on this trip. He went on to be a very uh, successful surgeon in World War I. And then on the left is Ann Ruth Wilson, who, or Ann Ruth Moore, who was a Seattle-trained nurse, one of our earliest graduate trained nurses here in Seattle who, who took the train. You can see her quote describing the men. You should have seen them with all their medals. Uh, because they were adorned with all their Grand Army and Reunion medals. And she also went on to become a very leading person in, in, in healthcare in Washington after this, but, but this was a kind of a beginning point. So we have our 160 plus veterans, and it's time to get going, both with this presentation and with the men themselves. It begins in Tacoma. Uh, you can see these buildings on the left. This is uh, a brand new federal building at that point. And there's a big send off for these men. There's this parade, hundreds and hundreds of other veterans that lived in Tacoma, their families, citizens of the city all come out to meet these men at this federal building, this post office. And they're gonna walk a few blocks to Union Station, which is this, this domed building on the bottom there, which is where the delegation train was to begin. It was escorted by the Washington National Guard Cavalry. There's only two troops of cavalry in the state. They were present for this event that take, a, I think about 30 veterans or so. Uh, it's a large crowd. The United Daughters of the Confederacy, the Women's Relief Corps, the Ladies of the Grand Army of the Republic are all there to see off the veterans. All the other veterans are marching alongside them uh, from that building to the train station. It's a, it's a big event. It's almost like a, a Memorial Day parade in its, in its level of significance. Here you can see them marching through the streets of Tacoma on their way to get on board that train to go to Gettysburg. 
This is in 1913. This is that site today. We can literally go stand in their footsteps where our Tacoma veterans departed for Gettysburg once again for the second time. There's very, very uh, dramatic, tearful send-offs. Bands are playing, fifes are playing, flags are waving. Uh, the men are kissing their sweethearts goodbye as they get on the train to go back. They're, they're painting this picture in the newspapers of how much this resembled the departure of the troops in the 1860s. Uh, here again, we have them in, you can see them on the right lined up. Some of them have suitcases and other things. The cavalry at lined up and saluting our Gettysburg veterans as they're about to board the train for Adams County in June of 1913. Here they are again. On the left is a, is a non-Gettysburg veteran, uh, a fifth Minnesota veteran from the Western Theater. And he led that procession with his drum and his son was playing the fife. And here they are standing in a salute before they board the trains to go to Gettysburg. It moves next to Seattle. This is where they depart Seattle, King Street Station. There was no parade in Seattle, but there was a, a gathering of about a thousand Seattle citizens. You can see the left picture. This is a group of our veterans, all veterans of the Battle of Gettysburg that are preparing to depart Union and Confederate alike. On the right is the fife and drum band from our nearby soldiers' homes. Uh, they're getting ready to depart. And it's again, it's a tearful, sad departure. The, some of the men are excited. They talk about them dancing. Others are kind of scared because of, they're intimidated by the heat. They're concerned about the difficulties of travel. Some of the wives are clinging to their old husbands, their aged husbands, and, and there's, there's women crying on their old veterans' husband's shoulder because they're scared they're not going to come back, not because of bullets, but because of the heat. And some of the soldiers say that very same thing. They say, we're not concerned about, uh, I'm, I'm less concerned, I should say this, I'm more concerned about the heat in 1913 than I was concerned about Confederate bullets in 1863. Uh, so it's, 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 it's really putting a mirror up to what these men experienced uh, departing for war and, and kind of a, a different but similar version of that. Uh, but again, we see a lot of rhetoric about them going back together. The old days are buried now, said one soldier, that we know no North or South. We are one in the Union. They constantly say that we were going back together under one flag. There is, uh, I know other uh, people have studied this and presented on this topic often say that, yes, on the surface, it was shaking hands over the stone wall and reuniting and this, but, but the reality was a little more, eh, they didn't really like each other that much. But it's a, really a consensus that is expressed by our Washington state men uh, that they were really glad to go together. Uh, so the train continues on. It goes to Spokane, makes a couple stops across Washington state, uh, departs Spokane. Spokane wanted to have a big parade and a banquet and all this stuff, but the train was a little late. They didn't quite get to do that. But what they did get to do is get off the train and take one fantastic photo of our entire delegation just before it heads off to Gettysburg. Uh, on the far right hand side is the governor and the adjutant general who organized this whole event uh, and took care of it. But this picture, you can see these are all Seattleites and men from Tacoma and Spokane and Yakima. But one thing they all have in common is that they stood on the battlefield of Gettysburg in 1913, fighting together or against one another. It's a remarkable image. Uh, they were all given a ribbon, this Washington State delegation uh, ribbon. 200 of them were made. Uh, they were given, of course, to the men who got on the train. You can see some various photos of them here, uh, but also given to those who qualified, but their health prevented them at the last minute from going, especially because of the heat. So if it wasn't so hot, we may have had 200 veterans that made the trip because uh, numerous just, just didn't chose to stay home and, and, and not make the trip. Uh, along the way, the train stopped uh, in many cities. It was covered in flags and bunting on the back of the train. It had flashing red lights. I have not found a picture of this and I'd love to. It said Washington State delegation to the Battle of Gettysburg. Everywhere it stopped, the people came out, whether it was in Montana or Idaho or anywhere across the country. Wherever this train stopped, people came out to see the Washington State veterans that were making this cross-country trip. Two of the veterans got off the train to stretch their legs in Haver, Montana. This photo, as you can see here, 
and the train left without them. And they <laughs> actually arrived at the veteran at the reunion two days late. So uh, a lot they got a lot of uh, joking and, and fun at their expense for having done that. Um, but uh, that's kind of just a, a neat story. They got left behind in Montana. Here's Akron, Ohio. Um, you can see the quote, a fitting prelude. So when the train stopped at Akron, the citizens of Akron came out. Little girls came out with flags to present to soldiers, to sing songs, same as they had done cities and towns across the country. And they interviewed a few of the soldiers as they paused in Akron before making the final aspect of the trip to Gettysburg uh, and said, you know, kind of talked about it. And and they said, wow, this is, this is really a... a, a a, a prelude of what's to come with the reunion. We Here we have this group of Confederate and Union veterans that have been together for three days now on this train. Uh, and they, they talk about how they've fought over all the old battles and talked about things. And yes, there's Johnnies and Yanks on the train, but nothing but friendly feeling prevails is what they said. And then one of them says, besides, there's only 12 Confederates on the train and there's 150 Yankees on the train. So we're gonna win anyway, uh, is basically what they said from here they continued on to Gettysburg. This is neat. This comes from an Adams County newspaper in June before the battle, a group, a large delegation of women, 40 women, because the train was for the veterans. The camp was for the veterans. This was not for wives and daughters and families. So our delegation of women from Seattle traveled there ahead of time and they stayed at the Blue Mountain House, or <clears throat> which I think is what, 30 miles? I believe some of you watching, I'm sure specifically know where the Penmar station was. So our Seattle women stayed here and took the train back and forth every day to and from the reunion. Uh, on the left there, of course, is, is not Washington, but other men arriving by train. Uh, and then on the right, this was a pass from the state of Washington, their eligibility and also identification uh, that had to, was required to be carried in their pocket. This is from an Ohio veteran uh, of Washington. They've arrived, and this is a beautiful photograph of our Washington men standing on the ground at the battlefield on Getty, at Gettysburg. These are men traveled across the country, <clears throat> revisiting their past on the, on the verge of reuniting with their comrades and, and reconnecting with this aspect of their lives they've been so distant from for so many years now. I love this photograph. Uh, now here's the camp. They stayed. <clears throat> On the top edge of this camp is, of course, Seminary Ridge, the, the vicinity of where the Virginia Monument is and where Pickett's Charge was launched from, essentially. Uh, and then, of course, the camp covers across the ground of where Pickett's Charge was made. The Red Circle is where the Washington delegation camped because they camped by state of residence, not state of service. Uh, so that's why you see that Washington camp. It's up to them to then go out uh, to visit the battlefield, to visit the camps. Here's a view over the encampment looking from uh, towards the Confederate lines, towards Confederate Avenue. That red circle again is where the Washington encampment was. You can see how much ground these old men cover to get around, to get to events, to get to their Connecticut camp or Pennsylvania camp or whatever, to reunite or visit the battlefield uh, as it were. And why William Henry Wright didn't want to have to walk from here back a mile to the train station to the train depot in the town of Gettysburg to sleep at night and then have to get up in the morning and come back. Here's another view. That's, this is also uh, where the Washington men were encamped. A lot of them, we have a, several uh, that were Iron Brigade members. There's a lot of Iron Brigade members that, that wound up in Washington. So they, we know a lot of them spent time at the Iron Brigade tent. This band at the bottom is called the Old Soldier Fiddlers. One of them was a 24th Michigan man. It was a vaudeville act that was three union veterans two confederate veterans that played music and they had just been in seattle just weeks before the gettysburg reunion so i think that's kind of neat that many of our seattle veterans had just seen them perform here in seattle the orpheum theater and then just weeks later stands with them in the iron brigade tent on the battlefield um, to listen to those songs played again so when they get to the battlefield it's a remarkable thing there's a lot of accounts of what they experienced on during the battle. Uh, but I think what's more captivating in a lot of ways is kind of what motivated them and what they were feeling when they went back. There's 
there's some, again, consensus in opinion. Um, and they're, they're, ha they're all having a very similar experience. And you can see that from these quotes here that they were, they were rather expecting that despite 50 years and despite the time, the, the, the distance in both time and geography that it would still look the same to them. And they do see that. And they, there's, these are just three of many, many accounts from our Washington men of describing where they went, how they could go back and find a certain tree. You can see William Phillips on the bottom there talking about how he could almost trace the footsteps in the mud where he and the members of the third Corps had run uh, in the wake of Longstreet's attack on July 2nd. Uh, there's a man who talks about how he slept in a, in a concavity in the top of a boulder in Devil's Den and how it had rained the evening of July 3rd and he was surrounded by dead bodies and he went back to Devil's Den and he found that exact boulder and found that exact spot where he had spent that night surrounded by those who had been killed in the fighting on July 2nd and July 3rd. Uh, so they're, they're, they're intimately reconnecting uh, with what they had experienced. But one thing that we see a lot of um, is this story from David Smith, 8th New York Cavalryman, Buford's division, uh, and he describes this, this compulsive need, this feeling for closure. And I find this story comes up again and again and again. And I think it's representative of their need for closure that doesn't necessarily just come from the story that involves the pie. I think it's, it's part of a, it's, it's a manifestation, I think, of them needing a closure on this time of their life, of this experience of, of Gettysburg itself, but the war. And a lot of it, the men seek out these things. And so what this story is, is David Smith, like I said, 8th New York Cavalryman, uh, he tells a story of the afternoon of June 30th, Buford's brigade arrives. They make their way out because they're, as he describes, raving hungry that they had not had a bite to eat all day. So they went out on a forage. And David Smith goes on to say that he went to a nearby farm. Unfortunately, we don't have the name of the Adams County family that he visited, but he says, I went to a nearby farm and I rapped on the door. A woman opened it and I went in and there saw one of the prettiest girls we had ever seen on the road. So during the war, then he says that she told her mother to get me some pies. And just as I finished eating those pies, one of my comrades came along in the dead run and told me that there was a party of rebel scouts coming along. And without saying a word, I jumped out, ran out the door and ran back to camp. And he says, what's bothering me is whether or not she thought I was putting up a game. He says that I'm not going away from here, meaning the Gettysburg reunion, until I find that girl and square myself. And if I can't find her, I will find my, <clears throat> I will find her grandchildren. So he's, he's compelled to find this family and say, I didn't steal the pie from you. I meant to pay for it. I'm not that guy. And, and so many of these men hung on to, there's another story of the Thorne family from the Evergreen Cemetery at Gettysburg, a soldier that went back and he had stolen onions from their garden on the night of July 1st, 1863. And he went back and he found the Thorne family home in the town of Gettysburg and sought them out and, and, and was like, I, I, I have to pay for the onions. And again, here's another one of our Confederate veterans, Jacob Heater, who brought this canteen that he had picked up during the war. And he brought it back to the camp. And he said, basically, I am going to search because it had a name and a regiment. It was a belonged to a Pennsylvania soldier. And he was going to find the owner of this canteen, which he had had for 50 years. And to clear his conscience, he had to return this canteen to his soldier. Uh, he also was a comrade of, there's this very famous photo here on the, on the bottom center, a Confederate veteran holding up his jacket, uh, that he was wounded later in the war, but he brought this jacket to Gettysburg. And he was Jacob Heater's sergeant. So Jacob Heater describes reuniting with uh, Christian Kuhn on the, on the, at the reunion too. Um, so they're seeking things out. And the most captivating one to me is probably this. This is Justice Rockwell, 97th New York Infantry Lieutenant, of course, responsible for giving that order, partly responsible for giving that order by the 97th New York to fire that volley, which devastated Iverson's brigade. 
on July 1st. He was later captured in the town of Gettysburg. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this photograph. But he sheltered in a house in the town of Gettysburg. And part of his trip was going to be finding that family, finding that house, and that he was going to uh, thank them and talk to them. Because the last time he had seen them was as Confederates were hauling him off, and he spent the rest of the Civil War in Confederate prisons. And he was successful in finding that family in the town of Gettysburg and reuniting with them uh, in 1913. But the veterans also talk about what they experienced during the battle. This is our uh, <clears throat> Lawrence Alfred. We talked about him a little bit early, commiserating with his Union comrade and excited to take this trip back. Uh, the right picture is him in front of his gas station in tire dealership in Tacoma, Washington. You imagine that guy was at the Battle of Gettysburg. He fought on Culp's Hill right where this center picture is, this rocky section. He called it a cliff. Uh, and he describes going back and remembering seeing four men standing in front of him from his same town in Virginia that he had enlisted with all get taken down by one piece of artillery shrapnel and how one of them, the piece had gone in his back and blown out his chest and he turned to him and he said he stood there and he looked at me with his dead eyes before he tottered and went down. And so there, there's a lot of the soldiers revisiting uh, the, the, the terrible experience that they suffered there. Uh, Thomas Lenar Harris, a house contractor here in Seattle, Pettigrew's brigade man, he had squared off with those Iron Brigade men that he was on the train with for four days. Pettigrew's brigade, of course, was invited to the Iron Brigade tent as well, so he was probably there. The Washington State Camp was just in the vicinity of where the Pettigrew's brigade marker is and where they stepped off for Pickett's charge, so no doubt he went uh, to visit that site. He was captured. Uh, during Pickett's uh, and sent to Fort Delaware. Uh, his brother had been captured on July 1st, and he watched his brother die in captivity in February of 1864 in Fort Delaware. The Iron Brigade men, they had a lot to say. Um, lots of great accounts of the fighting, them running back through the town. Uh, we had many of them uh, on that train who were Iron Brigade veterans, such as Edward Lind here. Uh, he On the right, this is him in front of his home in the Green Lake neighborhood of Seattle in 1914, just a year after. The left two pictures are him at the battlefield of Gettysburg in 1913, standing in front of the Reynolds Monument. So you can see they got out of the camp and they went back to see where they had fought. Uh, this is uh, every man in that picture. These are five Iron Brigade veterans who lived in Western Washington, all going back on July 1st, 1863, to visit the place that they had fought together. Edward Lind was wounded just on the cusp of the railroad cut, one of the last men of the 6th Wisconsin to fall wounded uh, in the charge that day. This is Holland Richardson, uh, the hive of activity in 1863, on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Uh, very famous figure in the Iron Brigade. He also was a Western Washington resident later in life. And that picture in the middle comes from a family descendant here in Washington. That is him on July 1st, 1863, I'm sorry, 1913, on the Gettysburg battlefield in front of the Reynolds Battery Monument. Here is a special veteran for me. He lived about three quarters of a mile from where I am sitting right now as we give this presentation. His name is Robert Campbell. He was an artificer in Hampton's Battery. Hampton's Battery was at the very apex of Sickles Line in the Peach Orchard where their monument stands today. Two guns one direction, three guns the other direction. Literally the tip of that salient. He survived that and became a leading figure in the town that I live in today as we speak. This is a picture of him in 1862 on the left and a picture of him here where I live in Bothell, Washington in 1908 just before he went back to the Gettysburg reunion uh, by a couple years. Some interesting stuff happened. This man lost a medal on the field at Gettysburg. Uh, they say that the mud and the, or not the mud, the, the dust from all those men was an inch deep or a foot deep in places, whatever they, the kind of language they used to describe these things. He lost his medal that was given to him by the Women's Relief Corps because he had been a Grand Army of the Republic commander here. Someone else found it gave it to the soldier on the right, the old man in Buffalo, New York, who found the name that was inscribed on the back of the medal, tracked it down and shipped it back to Seattle. So that medal 
uh, was lost in the dirt on the battlefield at Gettysburg in 1913 and recovered and identified and returned back to Seattle a little bit after that. So here's William Henry Rugg again. He was Washington's and one of the last fate, direct fatalities of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, he, despite his enthusiasm to go, which I described in the beginning, uh, had great trepidation and fear the last couple days before going back to the reunion. The heat in the Midwest and in Pennsylvania was in the upper 90s. Fatalities in cities from Philadelphia to Wisconsin, just from the heat. It was intimidating for these veterans to go and he had a feeling he wasn't gonna make it. And his quote says that I fear the hot weather in Gettysburg more than I did the bullets when I was there. And he says, just as he was about to board the train, he says that heat will finish me. And he says, I know I cannot finish this campaign, meaning the trip back to Gettysburg, but I wouldn't miss it at the cost of my life. And he made that decision to take that risk. And it did in fact cost his life on the train back just before the train crossed into Washington state. It was on the Idaho Washington border. He collapsed on the train and then never recovered uh, and passed away just, just uh, moments afterwards. And he was buried here in Washington state having died as a result of his trip to Gettysburg. Here's when they come home uh, again, unanimous, unanimous in their opinion uh, of what it was like. A lot of the veterans didn't come directly back. Um, Robert Campbell, for example, he went back to Indiana County, Pennsylvania to spend time with his family from the community that he had lived in before he made his way west. Others went to New York or Connecticut or North Carolina because the state of Washington gave them 60 day voucher for travel so they could spend time visiting comrades and family because they so rarely, in some cases, never got back to visit those communities and families. Uh, these old men often didn't have the means for cross-country travel like that, so the state enabled them uh, to, to enjoy their time a little bit and reconnect with their, with their families, which I think is very gracious that, that they did that didn't require them to get back on the train immediately, it did give them a 60-day pass. Um, but they say all very same things. Um, 111th New York veteran named Bernie Shaw says a feature of the reunion was our warm friendship between the North and the South. All hard feeling is long since vanished. In the wares of the blue and gray, those strangers shook hands and swapped stories wherever they met. The true Southern hospitality was evident everywhere in the gray camps that we Northerners always returned to our tents with pockets filled with cigars and new invitations to visit the homes of our former foe. Uh, and you see this over and over and over. Lawrence Alfred, our gas station man from Tacoma, having seen horrors of Colts Hill, says that time had washed away all the bitterness in the veteran's heart and that he was there to renew old friendships and make new ones, and he did both. And he also says that he was, we see this with the Washington Confederates, he says, we, we gained by losing because we still have our United States. And everyone who went, who felt, everyone felt that way who went back. So our Confederates, a lot of them say, you know, it's probably for the best that we lost because look what we have now. And Confederate after Confederate after Confederate of that Washington delegation say the same thing. It's kind of remarkable uh, that, that they all carry the same sentiment that way. So as they make their way back, like I said, they Initially, some came back. It was very quiet. There were no celebrations and welcomes. There was, uh, of course, family waiting for them, but, but they trickled in, basically, and then others came back. And a lot of times before the setter, veterans got back, the newsreel films came to Seattle, and they played here at Seattle's Grand Opera House on July 16th, just days after the reunion. The citizens of Seattle could go see film of the reunion and this description on the right says that the film is so clear that you can pick out those friends and family of yours who were at the event if they're in the film. Uh, so it's kind of cool how things have, have changed. In 1863, it took two and a half weeks for the news of the Battle of Gettysburg to even arrive to the citizens in Seattle. In 1913, they can see it on film within days. So it's a remarkable thing. Justice Rockwell, by the way, the 97th New York man who was captured and visited those 
uh, Adams County family who had housed him, his sign shop was just on the right side in the picture of that alleyway. That's where he, where he worked as a sign painter here in Seattle. They brought back some neat souvenirs. This uh, is in Tacoma. A cedar tree, a sapling, was brought back by none other than Lawrence Alfred. We've heard a lot of, of him. And he pulled that tree from where he had fought on the battlefield at Gettysburg, and he sent it back. It was cared for for about a year by a United Daughters of the Confederacy member here in Seattle, and then it was planted in Tacoma. Uh, I don't know its fate. I need to travel down to that park and see if the tree still stands or not. So in 1914, they planted a Gettysburg tree, and it was sort of a, another reunion ceremony and they say the confederate veterans say a lot of these same things so they brought back this tree and planted it and it was going to be a symbol uh, of what the gettysburg reunion was so a little piece of adams county literally was picked up and brought back here uh, and planted in tacoma and as they did come back they spoke to their communities they spoke to their grand army their public posts or united daughters of the confederacy chapters and United Confederate Veterans camps and churches and all other kinds of things. And this is a poem written by Justice Rockwell. He was very, very well known for his music and poetry and writing here after the war. And this is him, this is a poem that he wrote and he read it to his Grand Army of the Republic Post in September of 1913. And this is, I'll, I'll pause here because we're just about done uh, and let you read the sentiment uh, expressed by a Union soldier who had fought as he did on July 1st, 1863, spent nearly two years in Confederate prison camps from Libby to Columbia, South Carolina, survived that difficulties of, of the war for him. And you read the sentiment of what he feels about the reunion and what that experience was like for him and what it meant for all these men to go back and return, but especially those who had had become so distant from it by moving to Washington, what it meant to go back to them and stand on that ground on the battlefield of Gettysburg. And I'm going to end here. This is a quote from a Confederate veteran, 50th Virginia, another uh, man who fought in the vicinity of Culp's Hill uh, from Spokane. And this, I think, could have been said by someone in blue or gray, anywhere on the battlefield, anything that this, I think, encapsulates really the, the true uh, feeling that I find so consistently expressed by our Washington State veterans about the experience, about what the battle was to them, what it meant to them, considering them with their comrades, those they had fought with, those they had fought against, and then the combination of those two removed and set down here on the West Coast in Washington. And I'm sure veterans from California or Utah or Nebraska or Pennsylvania uh, all would have expressed, many would have expressed a similar sentiment to this. So I think I'm going to end with that. Um, and I want to say thank you guys again for watching. Um, if you're interested in more, uh, www.civilwarseattle is my website. It's found on all social media. Uh, and, and I appreciate any, any support in those, in those venues. Um, and this is just the tip, tip, tip of the iceberg. This is a book that I'm working on. Uh, so hopefully down the line, you guys can, can, uh, read the whole story about all 160 veterans and their trips back to Adams County in 1913. So thank you. Richard, thank you so much. That was excellent. Uh, I have to say my favorite part is when you said you live like three quarters of a mile from one of those veterans where they used to live. That 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 just that just got to me because that's yeah. you know, what we talk about the historical society is people's stories. That must yeah. be really neat for you to have that connection. Yeah, as a, as a quick, a, a quick note of interest to Pennsylvania people. So the town that I live in is called Bothell, Pennsylvania, or Bothell, Washington. And it's, it's, 
namesake family is, is the Bothell family, and they're all a small group of extended family from Indiana County, Pennsylvania, that all came out here specifically, basically to, to set down their roots and create their own town. So it's all formed on a specific group of Pennsylvania veterans. My home where I'm sitting right now is originally homesteaded by an Indiana County, Pennsylvania veteran from the 78th Pennsylvania Infantry, like I, where I'm sitting on it right now. So it's, it's my dirt is, you know, Pennsylvania Civil War dirt in a way, if you can find the right thing. So it's those, that group of guys, and, and that's, you know, really, really quite personal to me. And, ha and I also lived in Pennsylvania, in Lancaster County and Dauphin County for a long time. So and grew up traipsing the battlefield at Gettysburg. Uh, so having that connection so close, it just, it, it's, it's reflective of my life and my journey too. So I think I, I it's, there's a certain personal element that, 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 you know, it, it, you feel it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know I definitely learned a lot because no one ever thinks, you know, West of Virginia. So yeah, no, it's, and it's the, it's the same guys, you yeah. know, that's what I tell everybody. I'm like, yeah, this, that's those monuments on the battlefield. Also, those are to the guys here in Seattle. It's not to the, not to the dirt, it's to the men. And we, you know, they're here too. So you don't have to look far to find Gettysburg history in Seattle. They're, it, we're surrounded by it. Same guys. Well, again, Richard, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge you. with us. Yeah. I know uh, my viewers, I'm sure. Um, if you have questions, put them in the comments below. We'll be sure to get back to you um, yeah. down there. And again, I just want to thank you for supporting the Historical Society. Thank you for joining in for another program. And again, Richard, thank you for your time. What a wonderful thank program. Thank you so much for having me.